What I'd like to do um, is talk a little bit about some of the research on intergroup contact, and, but I must admit I find it quite humbling to be here to talk about contact in the context of, of prejudice and expressions of hate. And in part because, uh, you know, in my country, the United States, we've seen a, a growth in the number of hate crimes uh, since our presidential election last year. Um, there are currently more than 900 active hate groups around the country, not just concentrated in the South, where people often think prejudice is more fervent. Um, and also across the country, you can see just these ongoing tensions and debates regarding the role of race and identity and questions about who we are as a people and what we stand for. Um, and so it's quite humbling to come here to another context uh, to talk with an international group of uh, people about these issues that surround prejudice. And just to give you a couple of examples from places where I've lived over the last year, um, this is a, a map of the New York subway system. And last year, following the election, uh, this graffiti was put on by someone riding the subway saying that Jews belong in the oven with the symbol of the swastika. Um, and so that's, you know, in the heart of New York City, a very large Jewish community, and you might think, well, we might expect it there where there's a lot of resentment of Jews, perhaps. Um, but I want to give you another example, and this is where I live permanently at home in a rural part of Massachusetts. Um, and if you're not familiar with the state of Massachusetts, it is one of the most left or liberal uh, states in the United States. Um, and this is about 10 minutes from my house. It's up a mountain and it's a beautiful outlook where you can see the trees and the forest. And even there, uh, you see racist and anti-Semitic graffiti. But I also want to highlight that in both of these places, you also see volunteers, people who decided that they didn't want to just let those expressions of hate and prejudice exist, who took action to counter those messages. So, for example, here you see a man on the subway who just didn't feel comfortable sitting down and very literally stood up and just said, we have to clean this up. And so he and other voluntary subway riders just started cleaning the graffiti from the subway cars. And you can also see in the picture below on the right, um, examples of volunteers who took a couple of weekends, actually, to go up to the top of this mountain and provide an opportunity uh, for people uh, to, to clean so that people can enjoy the natural beauty once again. Um, and then across the country, you see so many different expressions of protests um, where white people are going out of their way to stand up with black people and other people of color to combat hate, to say that we need to stop racism and that we're partially responsible for standing up, that it's our responsibility to do so, not just those who are affected by prejudice and discrimination. Um, and in particular, one of the things that I've been interested in is trying to understand, well, what can motivate people to care in this meaningful way about groups beyond their own? And in part, this testimony from John Dutcher, a man who lives in Omaha, Nebraska, in the Plains States, um, his experience, I think, provides a good illustrative example. So he says, uh, he'll say directly how he felt about Muslims. He says, I hated Muslims. Um, and that his deep-seated hatred came following the 9-11 terrorist attacks. But then they also describe how something then happened, that Lutheran family services began placing refugee families in his apartment building. A Syrian family moved in across this hall, the Afghan family moved in downstairs, and altogether six Muslim families moved within his building so that he's suddenly surrounded by the people that he had once hated. And he describes how these experiences with his new neighbors took the hatred out of him, that his heart started softening. And he says, it took this to wake me up, that he's gotten to know his neighbors, he's learned of their struggles and why they needed to leave their countries. And this is a man who originally voted for our current president. And he says, if you had asked me before these people moved in, I would have said, keep them out until you get to know these people, they're amazing. And he wants to help people learn how to get over the hatred that they might have. And his advice to everyone is, if you hate a Muslim, go get to know one. And it's here where I'd like to start talking about the research on intergroup contact. Because where we talk about research on intergroup contact, we're basically talking about John Dutcher's experience, having meaningful face-to-face -face interactions with members of different groups. 
And part of why contact is so meaningful, and it's not just superficial contact, but really getting to know people's stories and experiences through sharing uh, stories and discussions over time, through those types of experiences, we become psychologically invested in others. That is, we develop a greater capacity for caring about the perspectives, experiences, and welfare of members of other groups, not only focused on our own needs and interests, but caring about and protecting the welfare of others. And so what I would like to do in this talk is to give you a bit of an overview of the types of benefits that contact between groups might have, and we'll see examples of how contact can be effective to reduce prejudice uh, between groups, to build trust and reconciliation between groups with histories of conflict, how it can help to promote the welfare and interests of disadvantaged groups, and even encourage participation in collective action for racial justice. And I want to start by giving an example based here and supported by the Council of Europe. This is an example of the Living Library Program. And the Living Library Program is in many different places, and what this program seeks to do is to facilitate conversations between participants, people who take part in the program, who are the readers, and the volunteers who are willing to share their experiences with prejudice and discrimination and allow those readers to ask questions, who are the books, as if those readers are going to a library and taking out a book to learn, but instead of it being a book, it's a human being. And in this case, uh, we were focused on readers who were Hungarian high school students who were given opportunities to meet members of the Roma community, who were the books, these volunteers who were willing to share their experiences. And prior to their experience meeting Roma, uh, we assessed the reader's prejudice towards the Roma, both before they participated in this program and then again after they participated in the program. And just to give you an example of some of the prejudice measures that we included, one of the questions that we asked was, whether Roma have gotten more economically than they deserve over the last several years. So that higher scores basically mean more expression of prejudice. And this is research that I conducted with Gabor Oros, who you heard from earlier today. Um, so what we find, whoops, well, there would be a graph there, and what you would see in that graph is that the students who met the Roma showed a reduction in prejudice over time, whereas those students who did not meet a Roma person showed no change in prejudice over time. So this is suggesting that at least in part, one of the things that contact can do can help to reduce prejudice. Now, this is just one example of a research study. In fact, there have been hundreds and hundreds of research studies looking at the potential benefits of contact in reducing prejudice. And so what I did with one of my colleagues is what's called a meta-analysis, where we tried to find every study we possibly could looking at the effects of contact on reducing prejudice. And overall, we found over 500 studies conducted between 1940 and the year 2000, which included data from more than 250,000 participants in 38 different countries. And I can tell you, across all of that data, when we pull it together, what we find pretty consistently is that greater contact between groups is associated with lower prejudice. And we've also learned a lot from this analysis about how contact reduces prejudice. And there's a few different pathways that help to explain why contact is so useful and important. In part, we see that contact reduces prejudice because of knowledge, that by interacting with members of other groups, we learn more about them, we gain knowledge about them and their experiences, and that in turn contributes to a reduction in prejudice. But at the same time, and this is something that Gabor had emphasized as well, our emotional processes are extremely important. And what we find is that contact is also really important for reducing our feelings of anxiety in relation to members of other groups. And the less anxious we feel, the less prejudice we feel. And at the same time, the more contact we have with other groups, the more we're able and willing to empathize with their concerns and their perspectives. And this also contributes to lower levels of prejudice. 
Now, we've talked a little bit so far about examples where contact can reduce prejudice, but I want, want to spend some time talking about some of these other outcomes as well. And in particular, how contact might help to uh, build trust and reconciliation between groups with histories of conflict. So here we conducted a community-based survey of Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland. We asked them a series of questions regarding their contact experiences with members of the other community, in part asking about the quality of their contact, asking do they have positive, friendly, close, or cooperative experiences with members of the other community, and then also asking on a more negative side about the extent to which they've personally suffered due to the conflict and violence between their communities. And then we also asked them some outcome questions. For example, you know, how do you feel towards this other group? Do you trust them? Do you think that they genuinely want peace with you? Do you feel that you're prepared and willing to work toward reconciliation with them? And what we find is that even among those who have reported personally suffering due to the violence and conflict between their communities, that the more contact they have with the other community, the greater trust they feel in those others, the more they believe that those others truly want peace instead of simply saying that they want peace but not taking it seriously. And we find that all these factors contribute to predicting people's own willingness to participate in efforts to promote reconciliation between the two communities. Now at the same time, in addition to building trust, we can also think about the role that members of uh, historically advantaged or privileged groups might have in promoting more equal and just societies. So we also wanted to see whether contact could be useful to promote the welfare of disadvantaged groups. And here we conducted a national telephone survey of white South Africans, where again we asked them to report on their contact experiences, this time with black South Africans, using similar contact measures to what we had used previously. And we also asked them to report their attitudes towards a number of policies that were uh, implemented by the South African government that were designed to try to promote racial equality and reduce inequality in South Africa. And what we find from this research is that the more contact white South Africans have with black South Africans, the more they were inclined to support these government policies that have real outcomes for black South Africans, such as giving scholarships to black students, providing special training programs for black people so they can compete fairly in the job market, grant economic incentives for black-owned businesses, and offer more radio and television programming in native black African languages. So we can think about how greater contact among privileged groups might lead people to want to support disadvantaged groups more than they have in the past, but we also were interested in seeing the extent to which contact might lead members of those advantaged groups to actually recognize their own privilege. Um, so at the start of the academic semester, in this study, white university students were asked questions about racial privilege. For example, they were asked to indicate the extent to which they believe that there are benefits to having white skin in US society. Then during the semester, these white university students were assigned to one of two groups. Either they were asked to interview members of racial minority groups and to write about their lives as a way of learning about their experiences and having contact with them in a meaningful way. And in the other group, these other students were simply encouraged to write a research project that was unrelated to race. And what they find as a result after the end of the semester where they were once again asked questions about racial privilege is that those students who interviewed members of racial minority groups in the contact condition, the darker blue bars, grew more likely to see how white people benefit from white privilege as compared to those who didn't have those contact experiences. So we're starting to see examples here of how it's not only an issue of being willing to support the disadvantaged, but starting to see ourselves differently if we find ourselves in an advantaged or a privileged position, and that we might need to question for ourselves as well our position or our relative position in the society or in the racial hierarchy. But then there's also the question of what are people willing to do about it? They might become aware of disadvantage of others or their own privilege, but what are they willing to do about it? So we wanted to conduct some additional studies, again here with white Americans, where we wanted to see what they might be willing to do 
to um, engage in collective action to promote racial justice. So we did these online surveys of white Americans. We asked them about their contact experiences with black people in the United States, and also regarding a variety of views that they might have about race and racial issues in the United States. And then we asked them about the types of actions that they might be willing to take or have taken to promote racial justice, including things like attending protests or rallies, signing petitions, going to workshops or meetings to discuss racial issues, writing letters to their elected public officials, voting for political candidates who support racial equality, and then more specifically, actively participating in protests as part of the ongoing Black Lives Matter movement that has been present for the last few years. And what we find is that those whites in the United States who have more contact with black people report more empathy regarding what black people experience. This empathy they feel toward black people fuels their anger regarding how black people are treated. And in turn, that anger is what propels them to both support and participate in collective action for racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. But we also have to think, even though there are all of these potential benefits to intergroup contact, there are potential barriers to keep contact from leading us to these types of positive outcomes. And one of these is segregation. We're talking about these walls that many people have alluded to over the course of this conference, that when groups are segregated into different communities and don't have opportunities to interact, they can't develop those same types of meaningful exchanges and cultivating those meaningful types of relationships that lead to such positive outcomes of contact. So if segregation is the problem, then what we need to do is provide opportunities, opportunities for members of different groups to get to know each other and have those meaningful exchanges where they can learn more and begin to empathize with each other. Another issue that Lutza also alluded to, a focus of her research, is social norms. Even if there are opportunities for contact, Depending on what we think other people around us might think, we may or may not be willing to reach out to members of other groups to try to engage them in conversation or really learn about their experiences. If we're concerned that people like us might disapprove of our talking with those people, then maybe we won't take that first step. So if the social norms against contact are part of our concerns, then what we need are examples. We need people who are willing to stand up and be those examples to set you know, not only give themselves the opportunity to learn from members of other groups, but to also set the example for the other members of their group who see them, who can recognize that it's actually okay, it's acceptable, it's normal for people like me to want to get to know people like them. Another issue we need to think about, or a potential barrier, are stereotypes that others and have talked about as well, these boxes in which we tend to put people, that we might actually end up engaging in a conversation with a member of a different group. But if we're locked in to thinking about those people in terms of the stereotypes of their group, then we won't really give ourselves a chance to get to know them. We'll only interpret who they are and what they say through the lens of those stereotypes. So we need to release ourselves from the use of those stereotypes and really try to focus on the person and embrace the full humanity of the person sitting in front of us as compared to simply focusing on a few characteristics that we are informed might be associated with their group. So if stereotypes are the issue, then what we really need are insights. We need those opportunities to learn who those people really are as compared to just relying on incomplete information about who they are. And finally, I want to mention fear and uncertainty. Even if we're prepared to let go of our stereotypes, we have supportive social norms, and we have opportunities to interact with members of other groups, it's still hard to do something new. It's uncomfortable for us to try things that are different. So if we haven't had a lot of experience interacting with members of different groups, we might find it uncomfortable. And that's OK. It's actually a very normal thing to feel uncomfortable or uncertain when we try something new. So if fear and uncertainty are potential barriers to contact, then we need experiences. Because just like learning a new language or learning any other skill, the more experience we have, the more confidence we gain. And it makes future interactions that much easier to take on. So thank you very much for your attention.